My paper is, uh, He Shall Rule Over You, Rule in the Church After the Fall. So where there is rule, there is order. There is also law. The absence of sin does not necessitate the absence of law. This is a logical fallacy that is born out of the belief that the law only becomes necessary when there is sin. And there are many who believe that there was uh, no rule or hierarchy before the fall into sin, uh, precisely because there was no sin. And that belief has had a profoundly negative effect on how rule then gets viewed after the fall into sin. Rule after the fall to many is viewed as nothing other than a punitive reality, that is, as a punishment for wrongdoing. So in this paper, I'm going to examine a few uh, differing viewpoints on rule uh, before and after the fall. Cites a few biblical realities that expose the weaknesses of these viewpoints, and then show also how the rule that the husband is to have over his wife, as one example, is beautifully revealed in the peace of Christ, which is to have dominion in the hearts of Christians. And this directly relates, then, to rule in the church after the fall. Uh, we'll also take a look at how we can move forward to recover uh, the male rule and headship in the church, where it has, in fact, been usurped, sidestepped, or ignored for various reasons. As I mentioned a moment ago, where there's rule, there must of necessity also be law and order. There are some commentators who claim that there was, uh, that before the fall into sin, there was an egalitarian system in place where uh, man and woman are viewed as equals with no hierarchy. It appears that this position has arisen out of the view of Genesis 3.16 that presupposes that God's word in Genesis 3.16 serves no other purpose than to be a punishment. For it is there that God says to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So the assumption is made that before the fall, there was no ruler hierarchy, and that this ruler hierarchy uh, spoken of by God in Genesis 3.16 is simply a punishment for uh, the failure to keep that egalitarian system in place. Now, to be fair, some strains of egalitarianism do see the man and the woman before the fall as equals in the eyes of God, that is, equals in the eyes of the, of the Creator as to their importance to Him. But there are other strains of egalitarianism that see the man and woman as equals to one another, and that there is absolutely no rule or hierarchy that is present among and between them. That begs the question, if there was no rule or hierarchy present before the fall into sin, would that not in and of itself entail chaos and disorder? Something that God replaces simply when he creates. The scripture says that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And so when God said, let there be light, order, shape, form, rule was brought to that which was without form and void. While it is true, of course, that the man and the woman were not there yet, I think this is quite beside the point regarding the broader general issue. Order, shape, and rule was already being established by God as he spoke and it was done. And then when God did create man, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Dominion is from the Latin dominus. It means to dominate. Uh, man, actually here, was to dominate. Um, man and woman, male and female, were to dominate. They were to rule over the fish, the birds, the livestock, etc. And so when man exercises this agency, he also is he's exercising control in some way. God's own image and likeness uh, are intrinsically have a dominion and a rule. So also then, uh, the image in which man is created in the image of God has a dominion and a rule uh, with it as well. Since it is a part of God's nature to have this dominion and rule, then it is also part of man's nature in the creation to have dominion and rule. This authority comes from God, for there is no authority except from God, as the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans. 
So the man exercised his dominion and rule not only when he named the animals, but also when he named the one whom God made from his rib, woman, Isha. As such, she was taken out of man to be returned to him by God and put under his rule. What kind of rule? A rule that was to be for her benefit, not for her detriment. Nonetheless, contrary to some of the contemporary voices, she was put under him. There are some contemporary voices that view being under someone else as being degrading, demeaning, lessening their potential as an individual. These are the same kind of voices that accuse the Apostle Paul of being a misogynist because he says that the woman is the weaker vessel to the man. Weaker vessel doesn't mean lesser vessel. Was it not true that Eve was already the weaker vessel to Adam before the fall into sin? After all, since Adam is the one who is unambiguously rebuked by God for heeding the voice of his wife, just who do the contemporary voices suppose the one whose voice was to be heeded would it have sounded forth in the first place? Was Adam not to protect Eve from eating of the fruit of the tree? And his protection... Uh, of another not itself and kind of exercise of rule, since rule does itself assume responsibility, is not protection for the benefit of another. But because some contemporary voices see God's word in Genesis 3.16 as only being uh, a reaction by an angry God to something done wrong by man, well, then they can only see the relationship of Adam and Eve before the fall into sin as being one without rule and hierarchy. And that narrow view of the law sees man's rule over the woman then as something that only came about because of man's own wrongdoing in the first place. And it thinks little to nothing then about God's very own image and his nature, bearing and carrying within himself the entirety of the eternal law. The law is in God himself. And since the law is in God himself, it is and is ingrained in his very own image, the image in which he also created man, well, then man also had the law in himself, but not as a punitive reality, at least not yet. Zachary Garris, a Presbyterian pastor in New Mexico, has spoken of three possible explanations of Genesis 3.16. Now, in each case, he is assuming that there was hierarchy and male headship before the fall into sin. First, a uh, possible explanation is to reaffirm the creation uh, marital hierarchy as a continued blessing. Second is to describe the perversion of marital roles. Third is to predict that the wife will desire to escape the husband's authority, but prescribe that the husband must exercise godly rule to restrain his wife. Garris completed his article by saying the following regarding Genesis 3.16. Regardless of how we understand Genesis 3.16, the point still stands that the fall introduced frustration into the marriage relationship. This is true even if view one is adopted. It was not that a husband's authority and a wife's submission were introduced as a result of the fall, as some egalitarians claim happened in Genesis 3.16, but rather that this hierarchical relationship was part of the created order and was now frustrated by the fall. Like all things, a husband's authority and a wife's submission are subject to corruption because of sin. Yet hierarchy between the sexes comes from the creation order, not the fall. It is not something to be overcome, but something to be embraced as God's good design. Well, my position on Genesis 3.16 lines up with Garris's uh, third explanation is po the possibility that is that the prediction that the wife will desire to escape the husband's authority, but prescribe that the husband must exercise godly rule to restrain his wife. Again, this is under the assertion that there was indeed rule and hierarchy before the fall. The man had dominion over the animals as well as over the woman. And because God indicts Adam for heeding the voice of his wife before he says anything about the fruit that was eaten, Adam's voice is the one that should have had the rule if only he would have spoken. Protection is a responsibility that is baked into ruling and hierarchy. Garris's third explanation is that the wife will desire to escape the husband's authority, but prescribe that the husband must exercise godly rule to restrain his wife. 
I think the clearest argument in favor of that position comes from Genesis 4, verse 7. This is where God preemptively warns Cain about uh, after both he and his offering are rejected by God. The verse has the same construction as Genesis 3.16. In the case of the woman, God was telling her that she will desire to take her husband's place as the head and ruler, but that he shall rule over her. In the case of Cain, God tells him that sin's desire is for him, but that he must rule over his sin. So Adam will have dominion over Eve, Cain was to have dominion over his sin. Now, if we were to speak of these instances in terms of the three uses of the law, for example, I would assert that God's words to the man and the woman would be both second and third use. He is, his words expose their sin and accuse them, and at the same time, they give instruction as to how things will need to go in the future. To Cain, God's words would be first use. He's being preemptive. He's so that Cain would not commit the sin which is already in his heart to commit, namely to kill his brother Abel. A couple of the early church fathers' uh, positions on Genesis 3.16 in a homily on 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14, that's where Paul is speaking about uh, the woman being the weaker vessel and uh, she was deceived and Adam was not deceived. Uh, Chrysostom uh, says this in that homily regarding Genesis 3.16. Your submission shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. For the woman taught the man once, and made him guilty of disobedience, and wrought our ruin. Therefore, because she made a bad use of her power over the man, or rather her equality with him, God made her subject to her husband. Your desire shall be to your husband. This had not been said to her before. But how was Adam not deceived? If he was not deceived, he did not then transgress? Attend carefully. The woman said, The serpent beguiled me. But the man did not say, The woman deceived me. But she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now it is not the same thing to be deceived by a fellow creature, one of the same kind, as by an inferior and subordinate animal. This is truly to be deceived. Compared, therefore, with the woman, he is spoken of as not deceived. For she was beguiled by an inferior and subject, he by an equal. Again, it is not said of the man that he saw the tree was good for food, but of the woman, and that she did eat and gave it to her husband, so that he transgressed not captivated by appetite, but merely from the persuasion of his wife. Chrysostom seems to have the kind of egalitarian view that believes that God equally regarded the man and the woman whom he created in his own image, rather than the man and the woman being equal with no established hierarchy or rule in place. Ambrose uh, of Milan in his work on paradise takes the position that Eve was to serve under her husband's power, not only so that she would not be inclined to do wrong, but that she would be governed by his counsel. He writes, She was to serve under her husband's power, first, that she might not be inclined to do wrong, and secondly, that being in a position subject to a stronger vessel, she might not dishonor her husband, but on the contrary, might be governed by his counsel, 1 Peter 3, 7. I see clearly here the mystery of Christ and his church. The church is turning toward Christ in times to come and a religious servitude submissive to the word of God. These are conditions far better than the liberty of this world. Hence it is written, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and shall serve him only. Deuteronomy 6, Luke 4. Servitude, therefore, of this sort is a gift of God. Wherefore, compliance with this servitude is to be reckoned among blessings. I think Luther takes a beautiful approach to Genesis 3.16 in that he sees the punishment that is meted out by God in view of the promise that has already been made by God. He writes, This punishment is inflicted on the woman, but it is a happy and joyful punishment, 
because it is not out of harmony with the earlier verdict which was pronounced upon Satan. If this stands, that the head of the serpent must be crushed, the hope for resurrection from the dead is sure. Then whatever is inflicted on the human race is bearable, provided this hope remains unshaken. We, we all, as well as the contemporary exegetes, would do well to consider that reality. The law as punishment here, which has been given, is not void of hope and the promise. What should be seen is that the punishment is not given for its own sake, as if now the woman would be should be oppressed under the hand of man, as if before she were completely free from any order, law, or hierarchy, but rather that she too will be delivered by the man who will crush the serpent's head. In Galatians 3, the Apostle Paul writes, Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. It is in the curse that the birth pangs of the woman are complemented by the pain that is imposed on man in eating the food of the ground, along with the sweat of his face. None of these impositions are punitive in and of themselves but they are to serve to point us to hope in the promise. Regarding Galatians 3.21, Luther writes, This is then the most excellent use of the law, namely, when a man can so use it that it may humble him and make him to thirst after Christ. And indeed, Christ requires thirsty souls, whom he most lovingly and graciously allureth and calleth unto him when he saith, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you, Matthew 11. He delighteth therefore to water these dry grounds. He poureth not his waters upon fat and rank ground, or such as is not dry and covereth no water. His benefits are inestimable, and therefore he giveth them to none, but unto such as have need of them and earnestly desire them. He preacheth glad tidings to the poor. He giveth drink to the thirsty. If any thirst, saith he, let him come unto me, John 7. He healeth the brokenhearted, Psalm 147. That is, he comforteth and saveth those that are bruised and afflicted by the law. Therefore, the law is not against the promises of God. Luther's view tempers the temptation to believe that there was no rule and hierarchy before the fall, so that we don't see the punishment after the fall as, as only that punitive reality under which a woman would now be oppressed with tyranny by a poisoned and toxic patriarchy. Contemporary commentators seem to view rule after the fall much in the way that one would see how the kings of the earth rule. Now, kings who are after God's own heart rule much differently than wicked kings who do not walk in the ways of God. Wicked kings rule for their own benefit rather than for the benefit of those whom they are ruling over, namely their subordinates. Kings after God's own heart, heart seek to rule for the benefit of those who are under their authority, knowing that they also have a master in heaven under whose authority they have been called to serve. And while it should go without saying that if one has been given authority by God, one must also exercise that authority, it still needs to be said. A husband, for example, who has been given authority by God, but does not exercise that authority, is being negligent in his God-given duties to his wife, most notably his duty to love his wife as Christ loved the church in giving himself for her benefit. A father who has been given authority and rule over his children, who does not exercise that authority, angers God, most notably he is not raising his children in the training and admonition of the Lord. Mothers, as matriarchs, have also been given authority by God over their children, and this is to be exercised, and it is to be honored by the children. The rules, hierarchy, and law in place, both before and after the fall, are not oppressive or tyrannical. They can, of course, be abused, and they are by sinners, both because of the fall and therefore also because of the sins of those who have been given authority by God. Genesis 3.15 shows that God's punishment in Genesis 3.16 is not for its own sake. It's not for God's own sake. 
it is for the sake of both the man and the woman. And the promise tempers the punishment, as Luther asserts, in a similar way that God's punishment of David after his litany of sins was tempered by the absolution he received before the death of his illegitimate child. Adam and Eve could bear their punishment, so could David. That means we can as well. The punishment serves to restore order after the promise has been given, or to say it another way, the gospel in the narrow sense frees us from our sin. The law gives shape, form, and order to the life that is now to be lived in Christ. This faith that is lived out because of the gospel is beautifully taught in Colossians 3, where the Apostle Paul, uh, in speaking about the putting off on putting on of the new self, writes, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When the peace of Christ has the rule, the dominion, in the heart, what flows out of it is true, beautiful, and lovely. And this includes the rule and authority that God has given mankind in various earthly vocations. This peace of Christ that rules in the hearts of Christians comes through nothing less than the saving gospel. From the fact that Christ atoned for the sin of the world on the cross and that he creates faith by the work of the Holy Spirit through his word. In the church, then, we are right to focus on the vocations of pastor and hearer as Luther teaches us. And the home is closely aligned with the church. There is much overlap in these two estates. If we, if we have godly husbands and wives, if we have godly fathers and mothers, and godly sons and daughters, generally speaking, things will go better in the church. The rule and authority that is established in the church by God is exercised by the pastor over the hearers, it is a rule and authority that is to be for the benefit of the hearers, and therefore for the whole body of Christ gathered there. The pastor not only knows best his God-given duties and responsibilities by scriptures such as, such as Titus 1.9, but the hearers will benefit from the pastor knowing this, and the hearers also should expect this from their pastors. Paul writes, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Encouraging sound doctrine includes the words that are laid out by God that teach that man has authority over woman in the church. And when the scripture teaches that a woman is to learn quietly with all submissiveness, and that she is not permitted to teach or exercise authority over man and is to remain quiet, the voice of God who said, and he shall rule over you, should be ringing in our ears. Hebrews 13, verse 17, also gives us clarity as to what kind of rule the pastor exercises over the hearers. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. The pastor rules the souls of his hearers with the very same word of God that he has been charged by God to read, to preach, and to teach. In the church, authority is exercised when the word of God is read, preached, and taught. This rule that the pastor has is for the benefit of the hearers, as is emphasized also in the 
in the uh, admonition to submit to him, lest his work be a burden and not a joy, which then has no benefit to the hearers. The pastor's rule over the hearers is supposed to reflect Christ's peace dwelling in the hearts of both pastor and hearer. The virtues of compassion, humility, meekness, and patience are all corollaries to this peace. So what happened? How did we get where we are today in the LCMS with women suffrage, women lay readers, women communion assistants, just to name a few? Women suffrage, women lay readers, and women communion assistants were some of the very same things that led other Lutheran bodies in America to start ordaining women. The ordination of women, not surprisingly, has led also to the ordaining of homosexuals and transgender persons. The American Lutheran Church approved the ordaining of women officially in 1970, which provided an easy avenue for what later became the ELCA in 1988 to continue doing the same after both the Lutheran Church in America and the American Evangelical Lutheran Church joined to become the ELCA. And yet, in less than 25 years, many congregations have broken off from the ELCA to form other Lutheran bodies. Um, NALC and LCMC are two that come to mind, primarily because of the ordination of homosexuals and transgenders. It just the it's the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back for some of them. The slippery slope got more slippery. The LCMS claims to have a high view of the office of the ministry, and in many ways does. Yet, when women lay readers, for example, are allowed in the church service, what does this say about authority in the ministry? Now, some have argued that authority is not being exercised when the Bible is being read. That argument simply flies in the face of the reality that the Word of God has supreme authority over everything in the life of the church. There is no other authority than that which is given by God through His Word. In the public life of the church, the Word of God should be read by the man who exercises authority over the hearers when he is also preaching and teaching, that being the pastor. Now, much could be said about the problems that have crept into the LCMS regarding authority in the church. And this conference is good evidence that we're not ignoring the elephant in the room. Some of our problems in the LCMS have come from a bad hermeneutic. Have you ever heard phrases like, show me where it says that, quote, a woman can't do the readings in the church service, unquote, or that a woman can't assist in communion distribution, or that a woman can't be a pastor in the Bible? My point there is that many times what people mean by this is that they want the book, the chapter, and the verse that says exactly those words. If you try to back God into a theological corner, it will always end badly for you. When you search the scriptures like you're looking for a verbatim verse, you will almost inevitably end up ignoring all of the places in the Bible that speak to the issue that you're asking about. Years ago, I encountered a woman on Facebook whose argument for abortion was based on Jesus having never said anything explicitly against it. Apparently, you shall not murder and you shall have no other gods God ignored. The spirit of the age has undoubtedly also had its adverse effects on the LCMS, the increasing propensity to say whatever and do the same in the prevailing culture has filtered its way into the LCMS. Feminism has also played a leading role. In his book, Why is Feminism So Hard to Resist?, Pastor Paul Harris has cited three general ways in which feminism is so hard to resist. One is feminism appeals to the spirit of the age. Two, feminism appeals to the weaknesses of men. Three, feminism appeals to the feminine mistake. Not only does feminism seek to convince women that fulfillment in this life is not to be found in such things as marriage and, if God wills, the blessing of fruitful multiplication in the marriage, but feminism seeks to replace these good things with careers, military combat, and professional athletics. So where do we go from here? With the spirit of the age, 
feminism and bad hermeneutics as enemies of the church, where do we go from here to restore the headship, the rule, and the hierarchy that is intended by Christ for his bride, the church? It begins with God, and it continues with us. Now, by beginning with God, I certainly don't mean that God is the one who needs to change, but he does need to be the one who is heard. The clear voice of his word, which is what gives shape, form, and order to our lives as those who have received the peace of Christ in our hearts, needs to restore what is out of place and out of order. Pastors need to know their God-given duties and responsibilities, as do the hearers. The hearers need to know those duties that the pastor has, uh, otherwise they will be quite ready to come up with things for you to do. The hearers need to know their God-given duties and responsibilities, as also do the pastors. I believe that if pastors and hearers both knew uh, the table of duties better under those headings in the catechism, that uh, what bishop to bishops, pastors, and preachers, and what the what the hearers owe their pastors, that harmony, peace, and unity would follow with some increasing regularity. Titus 1 verse 9 should point pastors to the scriptures as a whole, since it is the pastor himself who must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught. Yes, the pastor needs to believe the Bible for himself so that he can encourage others by the sound doctrine in those sacred pages, while at the same time being equipped to refute those who oppose the biblical doctrine. And the hearers, for their part, also need to hear that the pastor has that duty, so that, if and when it becomes necessary, they can remind him of his duty, so that uh, he doesn't fall off track. His duty first to the Lord, and then to them, the hearers. The hearers need to know that they are to obey their leaders and submit to their authority, an authority that has been given uh, to them, that is, to the pastors, by God himself. Your pastor keeps watch over your souls. He must give an account to the Lord for those souls over whom he is to rule with the word of God. Obedience to your pastor is for the purpose that his work will be a joy, not a burden, in Hebrews 13, 17. For a pastor whose work is burdensome because of hearers who are constantly questioning the pastor's authority will be of no advantage to the subordinates, to the hearers. Now, if your churches have a clear understanding of these table of duties and they are constantly striving to keep them, God bless you. Keep doing that. If not, we need to inculcate these passages of Scripture, which I believe will ultimately lead us into other places than in the Scripture. These passages complement each other in the table of duties, while they at the same time clearly lay out the authority that God has given. For if the pastor is not practicing temperance and hospitality, for example, in accordance with 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, not only is he answerable to God, but he is, in a sense, very real sense, also answerable to the hearers who do have the authority as the subordinates to remind him of his God-given duty from the Word of God. If a church is not providing the pastor his living from the gospel according to the command of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 9, 14, not only are the hearers answerable to God for this failure, but the pastor also does have the authority from the Word of God to remind them of this God-given duty. And district presidents, for their part, should, of course, also be made aware of this. They, too, can and should remind the church of her duty to her pastors. I believe that in many cases, if these passages were truly put into practice, that many of the aberrant practices that have crept into congregations of the LCMS over the decades regarding putting women in positions of authority not given to them by God would be corrected. <laughs> But what we cannot do is simply rely on the gospel in the narrow sense to correct errors in practice in LCMS congregations. Freedom of the gospel does not entail freedom from the law in the proper sense, by no means. Putting the law into practice in the Christian life is not necessarily a return to the works of the law for justification, and we need to stop making that claim. A potential abuse of the law does not negate its rightful use. Simply remembering Luther's negative prohibitions and positive commands, for example, that he teaches in the Ten Commandments would serve as a great complement to the table of duties for pastors and hearers. And if this is sounding simple, uh, that's because it is simple. That doesn't mean that it's easy, though, of course. Sinners make things complicated, as we well know. That's true for all of us. But 
Simplicity and clarity do come from the Word of God, along with wisdom, peace, and unity. Since a man is called into the office that preaches the Scriptures, a man should also be the one reading the Scriptures. A woman's silence regarding teaching and exercising authority over a man does not apply to a woman confessing the creed, praying the Lord's Prayer with the congregation, or singing the hymns with the body of Christ there. It does apply if she is being singled out for reading the scriptures or assisting with communion. The best way forward is for all of us as pastors and hearers to take heed to the word of God. None of this work regarding these specific passages should happen in isolation, uh, either from the work that is necessary for husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, sons and daughters in the home. As I mentioned earlier, there is harmony where there is harmony in the home, there is harmony in the church will come more readily. With the reality, of course, that there is disharmony in many homes because of sin, we still need to take heed in the church to these God-given duties, uh, given both to pastors and hearers. If the peace of Christ rules in our heart because of that ever-so-precious gospel that has rescued us from sin and death by the forgiveness of our sins, how can we not? also strive to live holy lives according to that same word, conforming ourselves to our Father's gracious will. God has indeed given us everything that we need to live under his gracious rule and hierarchy, in harmony, in harmony and unity with one another, each member providing his and her own contributions according to the outpouring of the Spirit of grace. For whether male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, we are all one in Christ in the order of redemption. In the order of creation, God has blessed us with different duties and responsibilities as males and females, not because he is oppressive and tyrannical, but because he's not a God of confusion and chaos, he's a God of order. The scripture teaches us to do all things to the glory of God with thanksgiving to him. All things include living in his church according to his gracious rule, and living under the authorities that have been ordained by him for the edifying of the body of Christ, as we all strive to enter that blessed and everlasting rest that is promised us through the blood of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. To him be the glory. Thank you. Do you think there's sin? Do you think part of the issue that we have in misunderstanding or, or not or just being lazy here um, not get, understanding the table of duties comes from the fact that our synod has been somewhat lazy in actually publishing the table of duties we give the scriptural verse but we don't actually print it out right? in a lot of cases like even our our hymnal does not have has the chief parts of the catechism and it has christian questions and their answers but they, they just have the list of the bible verses without actually giving the text there so in order to actually look at the bible verses you have to do all the work I mean, do you, think, do you think that's contributed partially so people kind of skip over that part of the catechism and they don't, they don't read it as often as they might read the rest of the parts of the catechism? Yeah, so the question is, uh, do I think that the uh, table of duties only listing the Bible passages themselves, the citations and not the actual verses in their entirety makes a difference in terms of uh, reading them and applying them? Um, I hadn't thought about that, but I think uh, I think it could be onto something. Uh, I mean, we are prone to uh, kind of skip over things if we're just provided Bible citations, you know. And we've got all the other passages from all the other parts of the Catechism. So, I mean, it seems to, it would seem to make sense to have the passages written out also for the Table of Duties, in my in my view. Yeah. So I think that I think you could be onto something. I would have to agree with that because I'm one of the lazy people that will not. Go I mean, the extra mile. Yeah, I mean, it's just. I mean, it's it, human nature. It's it's our sinful nature to be lazy. Yeah, right. But tied into that, isn't it also in, in common practice and teaching to talk about the six chief parts of the catechism, to which the table of duties gets excluded? You know, I would teach the six chief parts, and then the table of duties becomes the add-on if you have time for it. Yeah, so his question is that we focus on, uh, don't we focus on the six chief parts, almost viewing the table of duties um, as an appendix, maybe, or an add-on? Um, yeah, I think that's probably a problem. 
Uh, I mean, I think we would do well to make the table of duties more prominent from our catechism in our preaching and teaching. I think we, I mean, I think we need to not only, and I'm, so I'm saying not only in Bible study, but I think in our preaching, because unless you have, um, you know, 50 to 75% of your Sunday attendance at Bible study, which I'm guessing most of us don't, um, it needs to be, it's going to need to be preached as well as taught in Bible study. Yeah. Yes, sir. What would be your thoughts or advice of dealing with a congregation in a district that does use women as communion assistants, kind of the process uh, uh, to, to deal with something like that? Both, you know, obviously from a biblical standpoint, but then also from a, let's say, district slash synod structure standpoint. Yeah, so his question is how best to deal with a congregation that does, for example, have uh, women communion assistants. I think these things are always best, at least preferably dealt with from the ground up. In other words, uh, start in the local congregation working on it. Okay, now if it if it's something that, now if it's a case where you know, it's actually been promoted and brought in by the pastor, then you've kind of got another problem, right? So then I think you've got to have um, other brothers in the circuit, okay, who will, out of love, speak the truth in love to that pastor and say, well, you know, is this really something that you think you should be doing, should be practicing, right? And start with it there. I think I think these things are always dealt with best first, uh, kind of organically from the ground up. And then as th if things progress, you know, and it kind of falls on deaf ears, you know, over time, well, then you've got to go further. Then, I, then you have to go, you know, then you need to go to the district president, you know, and ecclesiastical supervisor. And then, you know, if necessary, on to synod, you know, for, but I think you've got, I think if you can handle it in-house, I think that's the best place to handle it if you can. And so biblically, I guess what it might, you know, obviously we need to be able to have, you know, support from the scriptures for our position and to bring that to bear on the situation. So, yes. So in your concept of rule you're talking about here, you know, before the fall and after the fall, and I, I kind of like what you're doing there. So thank you very much. The, uh, the, um, you touch on things more in terms of the um, public office of the and the teaching in the church and the like the, reading the lessons and etc but you, you really didn't touch on the other aspects of you know the various other functions in the church that one might have so you see in the act six for example they appointed men to be the deacons but we do know that in the new testament uh you know, the women were following Jesus around and they were serving him and the rest of the community appears. I'm just wondering uh, if you have any thoughts about uh, the other aspects of how, you know, uh, the natural uh, rulership and it, it's not a, 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 it shouldn't be a burden to you, it's really you're saying. <laughs> it should be the natural reflection of, of uh, how we are ruled uh, by the Spirit of God in Christ. Uh, and so uh, just do you have any other thoughts on the other aspects? So I think if I'm understanding your, your question correctly, you're asking about maybe other, um, perhaps what we've come to call, uh, what we in our nomenclature have come to call auxiliary yes. positions. Okay. Yeah. Well, I certainly would make a distinction, for example, between... Um, you know, let's say, I'm going to say, uh, why don't we have, this Sunday we'll have Jim come up and read the uh, epistle, right? And then next Sunday we'll have uh, Bob come up and read the epistle, right? I think that's, I, I don't think that's good, because that's just kind of picking somebody out to do it, because we want somebody else to do it. On the other hand, I think there is a, I think there's a place for a distinction to be made between that 
And if you do have a trained, a man who has been trained thoroughly in actually reading the scriptures and being a, a deacon in the church, okay, I think, I think there's a, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm advocating that there's a distinction to be made there between those two things. Like another, so in other words, what I'm saying is that we're not just going to, we're not just going to handpick somebody to put in this position kind of just haphazardly. We're going to, we're going to put a lot of thought into this and not only a lot of thought, but there's going to be training for this. If we're going to do this at all, you know, with another man reading the scriptures any, at, at any time. Does that kind of help answer your question or? I was sort of thinking about more of the women uh, okay. in terms of on boards and committees. Oh, oh, on boards and committees. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously we got our, you know, I think it's good that we have it, that um, we don't have women as elders. I mean, that's our position in the Senate. I think that's good. Um, I mean, I don't know about, you know, some congregations have committees and things like that, um, you know, and we've got women on those and they serve well. Um, and, you know, again, they're not, they're not doing it under compulsion. I think they do it for the most part, they do it joyfully and they do it in service to the Lord of the church. Um, you know, I mean, I think overall, I think some of those things are absolutely are good. Yeah. And I mean, we've got, we've got women who, um, you know, we've got women who serve as organists, right? And they serve the Lord of the church in that, in those capacities. So, yeah. Yes. I think it's easy to teach a married woman how, uh, with, with women's suffrage, how it makes sense for her to talk to her husband at home and thereby, um, she can be heard as well. She can feel, uh, heard. How do you deal with uh, widows or uh, unmarried women who um, might have the attitude of, well, I want to be heard as well, and there's no one no one to, to hear me or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how do you deal with, uh, it's easier to deal with um, wives, encouraging wives to speak with their husbands at home about things. How do you deal with uh, widows and such who aren't married? Uh, in the same situation. So, um, yeah, I think here is kind of a, you know, this is kind of, it seems to me like a lot of people think that your voice is what's heard when you vote. And I just kind of, I just kind of dislike that. I don't think that's really, I mean, your voice is heard more when you speak. <laughs> when you actually say words, right? When you actually have a position about or a thought about something, right? That's that's when your voice is actually being heard. It's not actually being heard in the vote, not really, you know. And and sometimes your your words can have more. Um, I, I mean, a word fitly spoken, okay, has. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that. <laughs> Uh, a word fitly spoken, right, is um, is a good thing, right? So I, I guess what I'm saying is that I would encourage our people to understand that your voice is actually heard more when you talk to your pastor or when you talk to um, the elders or the chairman or something like this. Your voice, your voice is actually heard better there than by thinking that your voice is going to be heard to, by casting a vote. That would be my that would be my way to go about it. Yeah. And if you're too lazy to make contact with your pastor, elders, or any other male, that's your problem. Maybe maybe you're not considering that it, that important of an issue after yeah. all. Then right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, Pastor Smiley. Just out of curiosity, um, would you would you say that the he shall rule over you is uh, specific to a husband ruling over a wife or is that, or, or is it more generic than that? So the question is, um, is, uh, he shall rule over you specific there to the husband wife, uh, 
marriage or is it more is it broader than that is it more general than that yeah um i think there it's pretty specific i think in genesis 3 16 it's pretty specific because they're the only two there <laughs> right i mean that's one reason it's pretty easy i, th I mean i'm not trying to be uh snarky about it but i i mean i i just think that i think it is pretty specific there in my view, that's pretty, that's pertained, that it's uh, applicable to the husband wife there. Yeah. In that verse. Yes, sir. In, uh, on page 13 of your, of, of your paper, when you kind of discuss gen uh, generally the authority that a husband has over his wife, and then you also talk about the authority that a both a, a, a father and mother have over their children. Um, can you dis uh, talk about differences or similarities between those two you know, definitions or types of authority, husband, wife, and then parents, children? So similarities and distinctions, maybe? Okay, so the question is uh, similarities and distinctions between the authority uh, in a marriage, husband and wife, and the authority in uh, parenting father and mother correct okay yeah um so in parenting the mother is subsumed under paul's words when he says and you fathers do not exasperate your children but bring them up in the training and admonition of the lord right she is assumed under that word okay so that there is an authority that both the father and the mother have over the sons and the daughters, the father having the chief responsibility, okay, the chief responsibility of that. Um, but the mother being the matriarch also has an authority and she is to be honored under the fourth commandment um, in a different way, of course, because she's the mother than to the father. I mean, there is a, because of how God has, um, made males and females the honor um the love the obedience so forth um do look a little bit different okay because of the male female distinctions in the creation okay um i don't want to get too uh into too much minutia about that but um and then so in the and then in the marriage the authority that the husband has over the wife is predominant to the fact that he is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her so it's predominantly a sacrificial authority okay it's not all it is but it is predominant it's chiefly that it's pre chiefly a sacrificial authority he is to lay down his life for his wife which is to say that he's to put aside his wants and desires for her objective needs for what is objectively good for her this is you know the the narrower application of you shall love your neighbor as yourself right you you shall love your neighbor and your, as yourself means that we strive to do what is going to be for the objective good of the neighbor not felt needs okay but objective uh good okay um so uh so that's chiefly what it is there is a um and i say so it's chiefly sacrificial that doesn't mean uh that it's without um you know a yes or a no kind of authority when it is needed hence i go back to the garden what should adam have said right should have said no and and if necessary physically restrained her right i mean that's what that was what was that i mean with what was at stake i mean mm -hmm. you have to i mean right what was at stake here um in the day you eat of it you shall surely die right well there's a lot at stake there mm -hmm. in that 